and welcome to today's HIPAA chat. I'm Carol Flagg, Advancers Media Network and Health Canal Radio. Thanks for tuning in. We appreciate your time today. This is our last HIPAA chat of the year, and uh, we'll be back in 2019. But for the year, we appreciate the sponsorship by EFAX Corporate, which is a brand of J2 Cloud Services. Uh, for the last 21 years, they've achieved uh, consecutive fiscal years of revenue and growth, and they have products to help with the secure transmission of EPHI. So please check them out at EFAX Corporate at enterprise.efax.com. Uh, like I said, I'm with the Answers Media Network. If you're new to HIPAA Chat, uh, you can check out our various websites related to health IT and, of course, our internet radio station, Healthcare Now Radio. Our host for HIPAA Chat is David Harlow. He's a healthcare lawyer, consultant, and award-winning blogger with 30 years of public and private sector experience. He focuses, of course, on digital health law and policy starting with HIPAA and state law, healthcare, data privacy and security planning. He works with healthcare providers, hospitals, analytic shops, uh, anybody in the healthcare space. He also hosts a radio show on our, on our Health Connect radio called Harlow and Healthcare that airs on our station weekdays at 4.30 Eastern. And you can stream that on any device. You can contact him at david at harlowgroup.net and please read his award-winning blog, uh, www.health blog, B-L-A-W-G dot com. Uh, follow him on Twitter at Health Blog and, of course, at Harlow on HC. Joining our HIPAA chat party today for our final HIPAA chat of the year is Art Gross. He's the CEO of uh, Ent Integration and HIPAA Secure Now. Uh, he's got a long history in the space of HIPAA regulations and security, and uh, you can check out his fabulous training products at HIPAA Secure Now, which focuses on IT requirements for medical practices. You can email him at rg at hipasecurenow.net and follow him on Twitter at integration. If you would like to check out past HIPAA chants, HIPAA chats, you can uh, Google us on YouTube and find us, uh, and obviously go to our Health Canada Radio SoundCloud channel uh, and check out various podcasts of previous events. Lots of it out there, too. All right, David, Art, Art, thank you so much for joining us today, and David, of course, back again as as host of host of HIPAA Chat, we're going to be talking today, uh, obviously, about the biggest news and some topics from 2018, and and that becomes our starting point for how to better prepare yourself for securing appliance in 2019. David, it's been a it's been a long, interesting year for I think I think HIPAA. Yes, uh, what a long, strange trip it's been, as they say. <laughs> uh, it continues. The trip continues. Uh, we talk about lessons learned. We try to wrap these things up uh, typically at year end with some lessons learned, but have we learned the lessons? It's another year of breaches that perhaps could have been avoided. It's another year of incidents that could have been perhaps uh, anticipated and mitigated. And yet here we are again, looking at uh, numerous multi-million dollar fines paid to the federal government. And in addition, uh, uh, far beyond the federal fines, the costs of the breaches are mm. enormous. So uh, just as one example, the Anthem breach, which is now a couple of years in the past already, led to an OCR fine in 2018 that totaled what was it 16 million dollars 16 million dollars yep sounds like a lot of money yes however this was just the last item in the whole uh process around anthem there were other costs as well there was a class action lawsuit that was settled for over a hundred million dollars there was action by state regulators. The state regulators didn't fine Anthem, but the actions required by the state regulators costs an cost Anthem hundreds of millions more in expenses in beefing up the security infrastructure. And in the end, this entire cataclysmic event, which if, if you add up all the costs, it's in the hundreds of millions of dollars, 
could have been avoided by better email security because all of this can probably be traced back to a phishing email that led someone or someones to provide access to a multiplicity of systems across the Anthem infrastructure and allowed unfettered access to bad actors over a period of months. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, it, it's interesting. Some of those numbers that you were talking about, you know, they, they spent $31 million on breach notifications just to notify those 80 million people who are affected. Um, $112 million just on credit protection. You know, you think about it, you know, they, in total, you know, without, without the future lawsuits, they've spent $276 million and now they've committed to spending another $260 million to beef up their their security. You know, you, you think about it, if they would have just spent the 260 million to begin with, they may have avoided all of this, but you know, uh, hindsight, right? So um, they might have even gotten away with spending less than that, frankly, to in order to, to deal with these issues. I mean, in this case, and in others, Art, I often hear uh, recommendations that a certain percentage of an IT budget be spent on security. Those numbers range all over the place. Do you have any particular insight into what's a good percentage of IT budget to be spending on security, or, or are you with me and just seeing those numbers all over the place? They're all over the place. I know I, I know fi the financial industry spend, spends the most. Healthcare spends one of the least, and you know, and maybe that's why we see a lot of this. You know, the, these breaches. Um, you know, I, I, I it, they're all over. It goes from two percent to five percent to ten to fifteen. Um, you know, and and I think it really depends on on you know what what the business is, what the amount of data, and you know, uh, my my recommendation is just make the investment. Make sure you you're making an appropriate investment in in securing this information, or you know, we'll be talking about you on the next <laughs> HIPAA chat. So. That's right. And you don't want that kind of attention. You don't want that. You don't. You don't want that. No kind matter of how much you like. This. <laughs> exactly. No. Yeah. So to, to, to me, good. to me, it's the security, but it's also even going sort of further back up the the food chain. How do we how do we take care of issues like this? To me, we start with the question of trying to minimize data collection and storage. That's yep. before we even get to the question of how do we secure the data that we need to have on hand for operations. Do we need all this data that we have on hand? Uh, in the case of Anthem, if I remember correctly, some of the information hanging around those systems was over 10 years old, really is the kind of stuff that ought to be archived in a way that's not accessible if there were access made to a, a, a live operating system. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you're right. Uh, you know, minimizing that data, but even to go, you know, another level in, in when we're looking at that HIPAA fine, you know, what OCR found was there was no security risk analysis. You know, that you're, you're holding 80 million records and you haven't done an SRA, which is the core of the HIPAA security rule. There was no system review or not enough system review to, to see that there was unauthorized access, you know, no technical access control. And you know, these are basics of, of HIPAA security that we're just missing. So, you know, in a way you, you, you look at it and say, well, this is a huge breach. You know, the, these bad, bad actors were in this network for two months, you know, moving from system to system. They, they used 50 different accounts to get through the network. They compromised 90 different systems. I mean, they, they were in there for two months going from one to another using accounts didn't anybody see this you know weren't weren't they looking at the logs and 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 seeing or or you know identifying that there may have been some you know anomalies going on in the network until you know until it was too late so you know there was a lot of of basics that you know not only minimizing data but just you know making sure you have your eyes on the, on the ball and, and making sure that you can see what activity is happening now obviously anthem has a huge network and there's a lot of automation and part of what they've been they've committed to in this 260 million dollars is to do improved monitoring to make sure that you know they they can see if there's unauthorized access or attempts so 
you know, getting that insight into what's happening on a network is is really critical in in preventing something like this. Right. Monitoring and auditing is really something that often slips through the cracks and people really need to be more alert to those issues. Even if you have a good system in place or you think you have a good system in place, if you're not actually monitoring and audit, auditing, yep. then you'll never know if something goes wrong until uh, until the, the this kind of major issue shows up on your doorstep. And, and with this kind, as you described, Bart, the, the multiplicity of systems and accounts that were involved here. I mean, usually one of our key recommendations is to segregate sensitive data, though yep. that may not have helped in this case because <laughs> they got into everything. They got into everything and they, and they kept going from one segment to another segment, from one business to another business. You know, this started at a subsidiary. And they were able to use that subsidiary and and you know go across the uh, the the network and you know, it's just it's just amazing that you know the complexity of of what they did and and the level of um, expertise to move through that network. I'm hoping it's a level of expertise and it wasn't that it was just that easy. But I'm assuming that you know in order to to compromise that many systems, they they had to you know have a really good technical um, understanding of, of the network and and know what to do. But, you know, the funny thing is, you know, we could talk about how complex it is and and the monitoring and, and everything, but it started with a spear phishing email. I mean, it started with a basic email that one of their employees fell for. And, you know, that basically opened the door into the network. And then from there, they, you know, they, they, they did what we just said, you know, compromised all these different systems. But it was a a, a very simple, non-technical. Hey, here's a here's an email. Click on click on this link. Open this attachment, and that allowed access. So think about all of the the security they probably have on the network, and and they you know obviously they have some sort of monitoring. Maybe it wasn't enough, but the the thing that started all of it was a simple spear phishing email, meaning a very targeted email at that employee. That employee fell for it. And then the next is is history. Half a billion dollars later, you know, we're we're talking about Anthem. So, uh, you know, as sophisticated and technical as it was, it really started with, you know, a, a very basic um, email. And the, and the other thing to think about is now that they've gotten all this information, right? So the information includes names, addresses, date of birth, medical ID numbers, employment information, email, social security of 80 million people. Those targeted emails become easier because now you have all this email, this information so you literally now because of one targeted email you've exposed 80 million people to potential other targeted emails so it's a you know it's something that i think we're going to see ramifications of this repercussions of this you know in the future right absolutely i think another thing worth mentioning here is that there was this initial single phishing email that may have resulted in additional phishing emails to others within the enterprise. But to me, one of the biggest takeaways here is that it is important to limit access to different systems, to ensure appropriate role-based access, yep. because no matter what you infect an individual's PC with, if they're walled off, from accessing multiple systems that they don't need to use on a daily basis, then the damage is going to be at least somewhat contained. Uh, it's not, cl not clear to me how well that was managed here. I, I totally agree. And then the other piece is uh, obviously two-factor authentication, right? You know, if you're just relying on a simple uh, user ID and password, that's potentially, you know, can be compromised. If you add two-factor authentication where you need to, you know, you get a text message or you have some sort of application or token and that would make it even harder, you know, to, to go from one account to the, the other account. So, um, you know, the, the technical, um, technical controls, as you mentioned, David is absolutely critical. And then, you know, adding, adding two factor authentication on top of, of these systems would go a long way in, in securing them as well. So talk to us about tokens, Art, because two-factor authentication using cell phones is, to my mind, 
kind of worthless. It seems like the kind of thing that can be defeated by a teenager with <laughs> a few bucks uh, yep. to to download and, and purchase some programs and tools and uh, clone cell phones, right? So so the the authorization can be the request for an authorization two factor authentication can be sent to a cell phone number but it ends up in the handset of the bad guy yep. who has cloned your cell number right that, that's I, something totally. that can happen pretty darn easily as far as i understand it I, talk I would, to me I about guess. other approaches to two factor authentication I, I would say yes i mean what, what you just said so basically you know it, the, the the basics of two-factor authentication is you know if you don't use any tokens or applications you get a text message right you know you you try to log in and we've seen this you know you try to log into your bank account in order to log in you get a text message and you use that text message to to um you know to enter that code and it's the user id um password and then that code so you know it, that in itself, and what you were saying, David, is if somebody was to clone your your phone, um, they could reroute that text message from your phone to some you know some other device. Uh, I don't think it's as easy as it sounds. You know, and obviously you you need physical access of those phones, and um, not to say that it isn't isn't doable, but you need physical access and, and be able to clone that. Uh, the next la layer is using tokens or or some sort of application. Uh, you know, we, we see that with uh, Google Authenticator or, or, or some other application that is running on a device um, and it is much harder to to replicate that or to, um, you know, intercept that device. So that number and that token is synchronized with the, the an application or a system. So every minute it changes. Uh, and you know you have to install that that application, sync it with the system that you're using. System knows about the number, your phone knows about the number, and that number changes every minute. That is a much more secure method, um, and you know there's lots of technologies that do that. So, base SMS um, two-factor authentication is definitely not as secure. Uh, using some sort of application or token is much more secure. But either of those are more secure than just, you know, user ID and password. Right, right. Because we go we go beyond, just to be clear, when we say two-factor authentication, the user ID and password is the first factor. That's something you know. And then the phone or the token is the second factor, something you have. Exactly. You know, and, and those and, are the two and, different kinds of things that you need here. Right. And then, you know, we, the, the, another part of that could be, um, biometrics, you know, fingerprint and eye scan. So it, you have to have something other than a user ID and password. And this is the problem. The the reuse of passwords is is rampant. All right. You know, so many people use the same password for their their EHRs, their, you know, their their email account, their Gmail account or their bank account. So, you know, if you have a breach and and you get all of these records and you see user IDs and passwords into a system, there's a good chance that people are using the exact same password. So a breach like Anthem or a breach like um, Target or Equifax or, or one of those, it, we wind up seeing the same user IDs and passwords being used. So someone could go to Office 365 and try to use a password that they found or, or, or purchased on the, on the dark net. And you know, if it is the same password, now they're into a different system. So by using two-factor authentication, uh, you know, we, our our employees and, and people should not be using the same password over, but at least by implementing two-factor authentication, you add another level of protection into a different system that could be using the same user ID and password as one that's been breached already. So we talk about phishing, and uh, to me, one of the easiest, not easiest, one of the most straightforward ideas of something to do is to train frontline employees better, is to execute mock phishing attacks. So we see if somebody can be tricked into clicking on something inappropriate, and instead of handing over the keys to the kingdom, what they get is a, is a lesson in yeah. what they just did. Yeah. Uh, 
Exactly. Have you been involved, Art, in rolling that out to individual organizations? Have Absolutely. you seen that work effectively? Absolutely. That's part of our, our core service, uh, you know, is to do that simulated fishing. And it, and it's just, it's, it's learning. It's, we're literally teaching, you know, individuals how to spot phishing emails, how to hover over links, how to look at the sender and where it's coming from. After a while, if you do it enough times and someone falls for it and then they get more training, that it starts to become a natural, you know, reflex to before I click on anything, before I download anything, let me, you know, evaluate it. Let me make sure that this isn't something that, you know, wind up could cause me to be a victim. So, you know, it, it, you think about in high school, you know, you, you, you multiple lessons, quizzes, tests, it was repetitive, you know, um, learning. That's exactly the same thing. In order to make sure that employees are aware of, of you know, spotting phishing emails and, and staying away from phishing emails, you need repetition. They need, you know, constant uh, or, or, you know, um, methodical sending of, of simulated phishing emails. The harder becomes these spear phishing emails, you know, the, the ones that are targeted, that it's not only, you know, when you look at phishing emails, these are, you know, sent out to hundreds of thousands of people, they're very generic, but when it's very specific, when it talks about you and it has your email address and it has, you know, information that, that you know, maybe a lot of people don't know, you know, you, like look at where the anthem, look at the information here, medical ID numbers, um, employment information. This is this is information that's not widely um, accessible. So when an email comes and it has that information, it becomes very hard to spot that. Uh, and you know, but you know, the more that that you uh, you know do these simulated phishing uh, um, campaigns to employees, the better they become at spotting it, and they may be able to spot even a, a targeted or a spear phishing email. There may be something that just doesn't seem right on that, and at least they're more suspicious. Yes. So we've been talking about Anthem and a breach of gargantuan proportions, 80 million records. And I want to turn to one of the other significant breaches of the past year, which was Fresenius, also a significant monetary fine assessed in that case, uh, $3.5 million, I believe. But what's, what, what's worth noting is that the number of records breached in that case was barely over 500. Right. Yep. But but what's interesting in this is, you know, you're right, it's, it's barely over 500, but they had five separate breaches in, in, in a matter of months, right? And they're yeah. all involved, um, you know, stolen laptops, uh, lost USB drives, stolen uh, uh, desktops. So, you know, it's all about encryption. You know, having all of this information and, and not not clearly not 80 million records, you know, barely over 500, but on devices that could be lost or stolen. You know, you think about it. We've been we've been talking about HIPAA and, and security for years now. You know, my, my company has been doing this for nine years. Encryption, uh, encryption is a safe harbor right? in, in, you know, in HIPAA and a device information that's encrypted, you know, it will usually does not um, lead to reportable breach, but without encryption, you know, this, this, it's unbelievable that they could have this many breaches and still not implement encryption into the, the point that it could have protected this data. Um, in this day and age, uh, any laptop that leaves the office or, you know, should be encrypted, uh, you know, looking at desktops, it, a lot of these, a lot of the systems, you know, have encryption built into it, into the, you know, Microsoft uh, operating system just needs to be enabled. So, you know, it, it really, really goes to show the value of encrypting data and, and the risk that USB drives and mobile devices uh, could, could, you know, could be to an organization. Right. And as, as you mentioned, it's a safe harbor, but not necessarily required under federal rules, but it is, in fact, required under many, if not most of the state rules. Yep. So encryption is really not optional in this day and age, folks. And it's important to recognize that. There are other sort of addressable standards 
there are other addressable standards in the HIPAA regulations, as they're called, uh, sort of optional or safe harbors. But in the case of something like encryption, and there are other things as well, they are required by state regulations. So they're really not yep. optional for us. The other thing I wanted to sort of observe about Fresenius is that while there were these individual unencrypted laptop issues across multiple sites and multiple locations of theirs, the observation and I think the reason for the fine was really focused on the fact that there wasn't really an enterprise level review, coordination, planning around these kinds of issues that there seemed to be a lot left to local operations. I think it's important for any multiple site organization to think about broad policies and implementations. While they may need to differ from site to site based on certain differences, there needs to be an overall approach. And I've, I've seen this over time when I've worked with clients that have acquired multiple companies and you end up with a, a, a company that has now, you know, had a hundred sites, now has 250 sites acquired from different places. Their original IT infrastructure is entirely different from the acquiring companies. They need to be integrated. There's so much that needs to be done, but the policy integration and rationalization is an important element of all of that as well. Exactly, and and that's what, what in the in the statement OCR basically said exactly what you just said that the the enterprise SRA did not address encryption, did not address encryption at each of those sites. So although they did have an SRA, it wasn't specific on encryption, and sure enough, the breaches were caused because there was a lack of encryption and and a lack of transportation policies. So that was another thing that was called out. You know, if you're going to have USB drives and laptops and they have to leave the office. There should be policies around that to protect that data and to ensure that that any devices that contain PHI are encrypted and you know that that are accounted for. So who else's misfortunes can we focus on for another few minutes? <laughs> How about reality TV? I love these reality TV oh, cases, right? I almost, the I almost teaching put that hospitals, on the, list. Yeah. the teaching hospitals in Boston that let the TV crews into their emergency rooms and blew it. I forgot about that one. Yeah, that, that was I think a, they were a million dollar fine, right? half a million dollars or so. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things I'd like to talk about real quick is the Allergy Associates of Hartford, because we we started with we started with um, Anthem, which was 80 million records. This one was one person, one person breach. But it's really interesting because this is a small practice, three doctors, four locations. And it turns out that the one of the patient was, um, you know, upset about, uh, you know, a a, 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 a um, something that happened at at one of the offices and the they went the the patient went to the news um you know the news station the news station interviewed the doctor and the doctor started talking about the the patient and um basically you know breached uh, uh HIPAA regulations uh, uh the the confidentiality of the patient so you know, there was a hundred twenty-five thousand dollar fine. It does nothing compared to that sixteen million dollar anthem fine, but you know, a hundred hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars for a small medical practice, I think is significant. And it really shows again, this is an a doctor who was advised not to talk to the reporter. The reporter, you know, asked him questions and he, you know, even though he was advised not to talk about it, he did. And you know, he um Look at look at now we're talking about them on the last tip of chat. So it doesn't have to be Anthem. It could happen to small practices and it could be because one of your employees makes a mistake, you know, whether they fall for a phishing email or they they talk to a reporter when they really shouldn't. Um, so, you know, when we look at 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 HIPAA breaches and fines and, and all of that, you know, it, it, it could it could be it happened to the, the largest of organizations it could happen to some of the smallest of organizations 
Right, and that's not a that's not a technical failing. It's a it's a, well in this case it's just a sort of just failure to follow clear yeah. and reasonable advice. But there are other circumstances where this can happen as well, whether with small organizations or large organizations. I, I'm thinking about social media interactions, where yeah. in this case it was a traditional media interaction but there can easily be social media interactions where somebody posts um, something positive on a Facebook page or some other forum and or somebody posts something negative on a Facebook page or other online forum yeah and you need to be super careful in how you respond as a healthcare provider yeah and I think it gets back to training you know employees need to know that they they you know they shouldn't be uh, you know, talking on social media or what they do on social media needs to be very careful. Posting pictures, you know, you could take a picture of 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 one thing, and and you know, that patient could be in that picture. So I think when you know the same thing we were talking about with spear phishing and and phishing emails and all that, you know, it really gets down to ensuring that employees are properly trained. They understand what is you know the the use and disclosure of PHI. They understand how to handle PHI. They know how to protect them. Their, their systems. Training at em, the employee level is extremely important. Lots of times we, we think of it as a technology, but you know, in humans and in human mistakes are the leading cause of data breaches and, and, and you know, especially in, in HIPAA as well. So you know, it's really important to focus on very non-technical, these, these humans. <laughs> they keep making mistakes and they keep causing organizations to, uh, you know, to, to uh, wind up on, on HIPAA chat. Right, those darn humans. Those darn humans, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, we've had a couple of other big uh, sort of technical breaches. One, I think it's not on our list either uh, specifically, but MD Anderson had a significant breach that was tied to mobile encryption issues, $4 million fine. Um, there, were, uh, there was a LabCorp breach on their... Uh, their their website. They actually took down their web-based system for delivering results to clinicians and because that was, of that a security a breach. That, that was a, a huge ransomware attack. Um, you know, via, via the SamSam ransomware, which which actually hit their remote desktop protocol. You know, the remote access into the systems. They were in there, um, encrypted the network. The same same type of um, uh, a ransomware attack that we saw with all scripts, you know, it, it, it very, very, you know, very uh, dangerous type because it wasn't, it didn't rely on on those damn humans to make a mistake. It actually went and compromised using a, a you know, a, a, a brute force way into a network and got in and, you know, um, spread ransomware, which, you know, prevented, as you were saying, David, prevented them from, from actually doing their business, you know, what, what their core business would be. So to me, that's that's an opportunity to jump off in a slightly different direction and think about what is your plan? What is your contingency plan for such a thing? My yeah. favorite um, sad story about something like that is that uh, in a ransomware case, I know someone who was at a hospital and when the ransomware hit and everything froze up, the first instinct was to go to the computer to access the files that had oh, the no. contingency plan. Right. Yeah, um, yeah. Yep. This is the one time where you want to have that stuff printed out and on your shelf yep. in nicely accessible binders, color coded and tabbed and everything ready to go so that you can actually operate without the need for the computer. Right. You need to be or, able to have or, that kind of level yeah. of contingency planning where you can be entirely separated and cut off from your standard operating procedures. You know, I think I think it really gets to that you, you have to you have to go through a drill. And and like you said, the first thing people want to go to and, and go for the contingency plan. But if they would have thought through this and said, what if the computers are down? What do we do? If there would have been a, a very low tech, like as you said, you know, that, that plan, those numbers that people to call in a binder, they would have been able to to handle that better and and you know continue. So you really have to think through this type of of uh, breach 
and what are you going to do? And a lot of times you, you need to actually walk through the steps and, and train employees to walk through those steps so they are prepared because the, the last thing you want to do is is in the middle of some sort of breach, try to figure it out. <laughs> and then, you know, you're running around with your head cut off. So, um, you know, it's right. Cause, cause we're all human. Well, we can, we can plan for forever, but there's, there's more than likely some piece along the way that we've forgotten. Yep. And unless you walk through that simulation, you're not going to discover what's missing. So you really need to do that. Exactly. Exactly. So uh, we've got to, we're going to be taking some questions here from the audience uh, pretty shortly here. I, I, I had medical devices and wearables on the list, and I, I, I thought about putting blockchain on the list. I think both of, both, both of those topics uh, were critical this year, but I think will probably be growing in uh, growing in 2019 as, as, as this issue of security and wearables, and certainly if, if blockchain can help solve some of these um, security issues is, is a reality or not. And I think as we move into the Q and a part of this, I don't know if you just want to touch on just for just a few minutes on just a couple of uh, best practices for preparing yourself for 2019. Well, I think we've tried to kick this off as we've been discussing the cases of the past year yeah. and thinking about what are what's the what's the framework that we need to apply to think about these things. And obviously there's the there's the three three sets of kinds of issues that we deal with in HIPAA that are administrative and physical and technical security. Each of those has a whole group of sub issues that you need to deal with within those in order to address security of protected health information. And in addition, we need to have appropriate policies and procedures and training in place for covered entities under HIPAA in terms of dealing with the privacy of health data. So again, we can have a perfect technical system but if we have, uh, if we don't have a system in place to address the sharing of information when appropriate and the not sharing of information when it's not appropriate, then we're not able to protect patient privacy appropriately. The problem is that we, we often see the situation where people are overprotective of data. And this has come to the fore even more and more in the past year or so, where healthcare providers or other covered entities basically respond to a request for personal records from a patient by saying, can't give it to you, HIPAA. Yep. You're sort of missing the point. And this happens sometimes. People are well-intentioned. The desire is to protect and secure the privacy of, of protected health information. But if a patient asks, the patient gets. If a patient asks for a PDF, the patient gets a PDF. If the patient asks for a CCD file or whatever format, whatever format you're able to give that a patient wants, you have to give that to the patient. That's right. very clear. And that needs to be addressed as part of the uh, training and uh, enabling of frontline staff to be able to share information directly with patients. I think the other piece that needs to be, you know, talked about is healthcare is the number one targeted industry. So, you know, we could talk about HIPAA and, and you know, compliance, but, you know, it's really security is, is something that every organization has to take seriously we talked about phishing we talked about sam sam ransomware and 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 different types of uh you know getting into systems and business email compromise and sending emails from from you know uh, other employees it's really important to focus on the security aspect of this because it isn't you know we, we talked about big fines and ocr handing down these fines that's that that is the aftermath <laughs> you know it is it's what causes these data, data breaches and, and the appropriate level of security spending, as David, you mentioned earlier, you know, making sure that you are uh, taking your systems and putting in the, the, the appropriate amount of security, training employees, 
doing everything you can to prevent uh, a, a security incident because believe it or not you know healthcare is being attacked they they know that it they, they that healthcare does not spend nearly what financial services spend so it is a much easier target and there is absolutely a bullseye on healthcare organizations of all sizes and it's really important to to do this you know take those steps to prevent these types of breaches all right uh we're just gonna start taking some questions all of that is really fascinating and i think that we actually had a couple of people chat in saying thank thank you both for bringing it back down to the small practice issue you know sort of that anthem breach maybe doesn't resonate as much as it does if you're a provider or, 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 or a, a medical clinic um you can use the uh you pose a question for us um the right side of the dashboard and uh you can email david and art offline david at harlowgroup.net and our gross at archie at integration.net uh so i'm going to just sort of dive into some of these questions and uh we will get uh, some answers uh to the audience so uh uh, one of the attendees said, we, we are having a current discussion regarding changing passwords and how often passwords should be changed. Are there any requirements to password changing? You know, that, that's interesting. You know, at one time we, we thought about the, 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 you know, the best practices was to change passwords often. Um, you know, every, every month, every, every, you know, um, every 14 days the, the the nist came out with with guidelines it says that's not the right thing to do <laughs> that really changing passwords frequently causes people to write down passwords causes people to use the same passwords because it's hard to remember so you know um there isn't a you know HIPAA regulations and say you have to change passwords every 30 days or 60 days but you know, uh, the, the, the thought around passwords now are that they need to be complex, they need to be, you know, um, very long, but they don't need to be changed as often as people did in the past. So, you know, that, that caused a lot of controversy. There's a lot of people who say, oh, no, they, you know, uh, you think about why you change a password. Uh, passwords are, are being changed because if someone's in, in the system using that compromised password, they could be in that system and accessing the information for as long as that password doesn't change. So if you don't, don't, you know, if you change it every 30 days, you may limit the the amount of access. If you, if you, you know, you don't change it for a year, someone could be accessing that. Um, you know, it gets back into two-factor authentication that we were talking about, complex passwords. But the guidance right now is frequent password changes is not the right thing to do. Controversial, I know. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's see here. Seeing that providers are doing their own security assessments, how frequently should they have an external assessment done? Maybe missing areas of risk and an external party could see easier. Yep. I think that's really true. And and certainly from a, uh, an audit standpoint, David, you've talked a lot about that. And we've talked about that in many HIPAA chats, actually. <laughs> Sure. There's so many things that you want to be able to do, not because uh, you're expecting to be to be breached, but but, but because you, you you may be breached. And if there is a breach, you want to be able to show that you've done everything possible to avoid the breach. I mean, a breach is almost inevitable in this day and age. But you want to be able to show that you've done everything humanly possible, everything technically possible, to avoid the breach and that will have the effect of minimizing the sanctions that are levied against you um, and you know and cms cms you know their guidelines are that you know that that security risk analysis assessments should be done on an annual basis you know if you look at at the requirement for meaningful use the requirement for macro and mips those are annual risk assessments so you know you can absolutely do a risk assessment without a third party um, but it, you have to make sure that that will stand up to an audit and investigation. But you know, CMS has has really you know made the gui given guidelines that those should be done at least annually um, 
for an organization. And as David said, you know, we, we see all the time when there's a data breach, OCR during that investigation, show us that you have, you know, the, the latest risk assessment before the breach and the latest risk assessment after the breach. So, uh, you know, we, we have seen it time and time again, OCR is absolutely requesting a copy of that, that, that security risk analysis. Right. And, and and what did you do with it? I mean, those yep. I, I see these, I work with clients all the time when this comes in the door and we get the, uh, you know, the traffic light approach and the re final report, it's red, yellow, green. Well, if it's yellow or red, what did you do? You can't yep. just file that report. You need to have a plan for fixing that. Doesn't mean you have to fix everything tomorrow, yep. but you need to have a plan to fix things and you need to knock them off one at a time or two at a time. And until they're all taken care of. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so uh, sort of on our list was sort of medical devices and, and, and wearables. Well, health apps that are connected to EHRs through an API be subject to all HIPAA regulations? Well, it depends. <laughs> it depends. <laughs> it depends. <laughs> Let me just end there. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, <laughs> depends where the app is coming from okay if it is a personal app that you're able to connect to an EHR to download information that functions as a personal health record then that is not subject to HIPAA the personal health record provider that the company that produces that app is subject to similar yet different rules under the Federal Trade Commission regarding uh, breaches and security and so forth. But as far as HIPAA goes, HIPAA applies only to covered entities and business associates. So if a covered entity, meaning typically a healthcare provider or an insurance company provides you with a uh, data or with a data tool, then they're responsible. They can provide it directly or they can provide it through a business associate. So for example, if uh, your local medical center uses Epic electronic health records and they provide you with a personal health record, uh, my chart, which gives you a view of some of the information that's in your Epic electronic health record, then that is being provided to you by the healthcare provider through their business associate, the electronic health record slash personal health record provider. Right. That, that relationship is subject to HIPAA an app that you download from the app store and are able to download information or enter information into that's not subject to HIPAA. And you know, what's interesting is like, we think about the Fitbit, right? And you know, there's so many people are using the Fitbit. Uh, you, you could put information in and, and um, that is all personal as David was saying, you know, that the other thing is Fitbit realized that, you know what, we, why don't we start working with some of these covered entities and, and capturing data? They actually went through HIPAA compliance and they will sign a business associate agreement with a covered entity. So, you know, they're, that they're, we're, we're seeing more and more of these, these wearables are saying, you know what, I, well, I'm not subject to HIPAA, but I'm also, then I have to deal with the consumer, but I could also, you know, have a wearable and, and, you know, and actually have it prescribed or, or used through doctors or, or hospitals. And then in order to do that, they have to be business associates and the, their application, their wearable, whatever that is, and the data, you know, whether that's on a portal or has to all be, you know, secured. So we're starting to see that, that some of the wearable um, device makers are starting to take HIPAA more seriously because it you know, expands their market and you know they 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 want to secure that data as well right just as an aside for our purposes these device manufacturers consumer device manufacturers the sensors are more are sometimes more uh, um, sophisticated than what the the data that we get as consumers might lead us to believe 
and there's a sort of an additional layer of data that could be accessed by medical researchers, et cetera, under specific use cases and under specific data protection agreements. So it's very interesting. There are multiple uses sometimes for the same devices. Yep. But again, the context matters. So it's not it's not a simple case of what is the thing that you're using. It really matters who gave it to you and what are you using it for. Exactly. This is a great question. As a business associate, we are having difficulty getting our covered entity clients to sign BAAs. Are we both liable and potentially fined if the BAA we drafted is not signed by the covered entity or is just a covered entity on the hook? Good question. Good question. So, you know, uh, uh, the, I, I'm going to start it, David. I'm going to kick it over to you then. You know, sure. clearly, in order for a covered entity to disclose or, or work, you know, disclose PHI or work with a business associate, HIPAA requires a, a business associate agreement to be in place. Uh, there, there's been talk that even if a business associate is doing work for a, uh, a covered entity and you know, there is no business associate agreement in place, they are still a business associate. So the, the question, David, you know, from, a, from a legal point of view is, is if the business associate wants to have a business associate agreement in place, but the covered entity refused to sign it, What's the lie? Obviously, the covered entity is not in compliance because they need to have that to work with, you know, a third party in disclosing PHI. But what what's the what's the liability that's sitting on that business associate? Right. So, I mean, the the requirements on both parties, as far as I recall offhand, is in a sense independent of the agreement itself. So there are requirements imposed by regulation. And then there's a requirement for a contractual relationship between the parties. Often the business associate agreement goes above and beyond the bare requirements of the HIPAA regulations and imposes additional requirements. I've, I've often faced the situation where an, an entity that to me, looks and acts like a business associate, insists that it is not a business associate and refuses to sign business associate agreements. Yep. And then the covered entity needs to make a business decision. Are we going to deal with this company because they offer a tool or a, or a product that we really want to use? And can we, can we come around to understanding their perspective? Are they not indeed a business associate. From the business associate's perspective, if a covered entity is seeking to contract with you for dealing with PHI in any way, it seems clear that the covered entity would need to and would want to enter into a business associate agreement that frankly protects the covered entity as much as the business associate. So it's sort of a surprising situation to yep. be in. I agree. Yeah. So it seems like the number of breach lawsuits seems to have grown exponentially in 2018. Do you see this as an upward trend in 2019? It's a, it's a uh, depending on your perspective, you may call it a virtuous cycle, right? Uh -huh. uh, as these, as these things happen, <laughs> millions of dollars flow into OCR, and some of those millions stay in the OCR budget and are used for enforcement in following years. So the resources available for enforcement grow as a result of the fines collected. Right. Uh, another crystal ball question. So what is the most critical privacy and security threat that may impact our medical practice in 2019? And how can we, how can we avoid it? Still thinking it goes back to human, human beings, but, 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 but weigh in. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think, I think, you know, from a security point of view, as I mentioned before, you know, the healthcare sector is, is being targeted 
ransomware and phishing and spear phishing and 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 all of that so you know that is not going away you know that that if if anything it's going to get worse especially with all of these breaches that that we're seeing because all of this data is accessible so targeted phishing and spear phishing is going to become easier it's going to be harder to spot uh, combine that with social media, LinkedIn, Facebook, the amount of information you can gather on somebody is just, it's unbelievable. And and if you want to target an, an employee or employees at an organization, it becomes much easier. So I, I think, you know, if we're going to crystal ball is that is not going away and email and phishing and email compromise is not going away. And, and that's that's where a, a big part of of focus from a security point of view, uh, you know, I, I think I think organizations should be focusing on the human element. And I th I couldn't agree more. But I think that we also need to focus on the technical guardrails that we are able to put in place in order to deal with the fundamental frailties of what we might call wetware, <laughs> the humans. <laughs> and um, so, so what does that mean? That means making life more difficult for us as employees and managers and executives in healthcare organizations. That means having email on one machine and having all the good stuff on another machine. Uh, and and have those environments managed in a way that they do not intersect. If yep. email is such a risk, it can't get anywhere near the good stuff. Yeah, you know the the balance between security and and ease of use. You know, it, the more secure, the harder it is to use. The easier it is to use, the less secure. There's got to be a balance. And and as we see more and more breaches, that balance may need to move more towards security. And, you know, as Dave was saying, that it's inconvenient to use two different machines. It's inconvenient to, to log into two different networks to get data. But the more that we can protect this data, uh, you know, the, the, the better it is and less likely there, there's a chance of a breach, but it becomes more inconvenient. Um, and, and, you know, p employees scream and managers scream and then it doesn't get <laughs> doesn't get implemented. So, uh, you know, we, we really have to think towards the security aspects and ensuring that those technical controls are are in place. Right. Well, believe it or not, we're just about out of time. Uh, please email David at David at Harlow Group dot net and Art Gross at Art G at integration.net with your questions. We did not get to everybody's questions. We ran out of time here, but we'll be back again in 2019 for HIPAA chat because, as you said, uh, there's no shortage of uh, topics to talk about or, 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 or unfortunately breaches and all of that. I want to thank you, David, for being the host this year. I'm looking forward to 2019. And Art, thank you so much for being our guest. Thank you very much for the invite. I, I had a great time. Thank you, David. Thank you, Carol.